and a warm welcome to the Open Treasury podcast, your go-to source for the latest news and analysis in corporate cash and treasury management. This show is brought to you by ctmfile.com and the Treasury News Network, where treasury professionals learn and share the information that matters most. Welcome to the Open Treasury Podcast. I am Craig Jeffrey. Push is still off. In the guest seat today is Ben Poole, a writer for CTM File at Treasury Media Outlet. Welcome to the Open Treasury Podcast, Ben. Thanks, Craig. Great to be on. So just as a preview to what we're talking about today, we'll have three themes. Two are about the economy, two on technology, and the third one is on anti-greenwashing. Ben, let's start off with the China bank-backed dollar sales uh, challenge of default. Does the loss of another funding channel indicate an additional sign of deepening challenges? Are we seeing just the normal oscillation of weakening and strengthening in this uh, economy? And then maybe one more thing. Does this possibly lead to contagion in either the broader Chinese economy or the global economy, given where China sits? Thanks, Craig. Yeah, it is quite a significant uh, issue, I think, that's brought up by this story. Um, Sales of China dollar notes carrying a standby letter of credit, uh, which is effectively like the lenders pledged to repay if the issuer can't. That slumped uh, 90 percent to just over one billion dollars so far this year from the previous year, according to info from Bloomberg. And uh, that outpaced a 52 percent drop in China dollar bond sales to 52.2 billion in the same period. So it's clearly significant, I think. And it's not something that I think is going to change direction anytime soon. Perhaps it's probably looking at the bigger picture. It's just another sign that all is not well, perhaps in the Chinese economy, uh, which has certainly, you know, (laughs) in recent years, fallen off the rocket ship it was riding in the early part of this century. This week, we also saw it kind of linked to the impacts perhaps on the wider China economy. China's factory activity contracted for a second successive month and non-manufacturing activity touched a further new low this year as well. So uh, there's definitely fundamental issues that China's finding in its economy at the moment. So GDP over there, the economic growth figures last month were slightly stronger than expected at 4.9% compared to 4.6% anticipated. So economic data is a bit all over the place coming out of China at the moment, which I think kind of just underlines the, the possible fragility that's there. Yeah, that makes look is interesting. So continuing the discussion on the economy, we'll move to a neighboring Asian country. Uh, the article is data shows Japan's inflation edging higher. I think we all know Japan is you know, known for 0% inflation and negative interest rates from the central bank, but pressures are mounting with inflation being over 2% for more than a year above their target range. This is putting pressure on compensation. And so the general question that I wanted to address was, Will 2024 signal the end of Bank of Japan's negative interest rate policies? And is there a broader implication? So two-thirds of the economists think that uh, that will be ended in 2024. I look at this, Ben, as you you can only contain Adam Smith's invisible hand so long and so far. far They've got the aging workforce. The level of debt that they carry is significant. And even though they're, they're certainly one of the most disciplined major economies of the world, this is showing a shift, the inevitability that things will revert back to the mean. I guess the question is, is that going to be very disruptive or not? Being one of the largest economies, you know, another sign of mixed awareness. Yeah, something's got to give, you feel, <laughs> in that regard. Let's shift to topic number two, theme number two. The first article, Ben, is ICC from the United Kingdom. You know, there's an article entitled ICC highlights the benefits of trade digitalization. This report on the ETDA is an interesting piece. And so is this governance structure necessary to support the drive to efficiency to push the broader market more quickly than, let's say, natural market causes would bring it? And is there a broader value to trade here, not just for the UK, but will this lead other nations to follow with legislation or just faster adoption? Yeah, I think it is um, very helpful to the overall trade ecosystem. I think we've been reading stories about um, developments of 
digital trade finance instruments that can be used in place of paper-based instruments. But if you don't have that legal backing behind it, then it's difficult to know, you know, where can you use these instruments. And if you want a uniform approach for your corporate across all of your trading partners, you don't want to be trying to think, okay, am I doing digital in this market and then paper in another? So that's where the kind of the legal underpinning of it all is really, really important. And yeah, like you say, the the UK's Electronic Trade Documents Act came in in September this year, which does enshrine in law the electronic versions of trade instruments, guarantees, promissory notes, bills of exchange, all those instruments that we know from the trade world can be used. And uh, while that law was just obviously passed in one country, it will have a global influence, I think. Depending on who you speak to, between 60 and 80% of all global trade is undertaken under an English law contract. So the impact for the legislation is very far reaching. And uh, you've got other countries that are at a similar point with their legal recognition. So Singapore has something very similar. And in the US, it's very interesting. There's kind of not at federal level, but at kind of state level, there's a lot of work that's happened on this. So if you start connecting the dots, you know, for the UK law, which is, again, you know, more than half of all the global trade contracts, connect that to the US, connect that to Singapore, and more, you know, it's only going in one way with the MLETR push globally as well, which is like, you could say, like the global version of the ETDA. So for corporate treasurers, I think the legal recognition should mean that they can streamline how they finance their supply chains, while also delivering significant security to their trade relationships. Having that legal basis makes it easier for a treasurer to take decisions around the risks of conducting their business and would provide, I think, perhaps like two opportunities there. First, access to additional capital and additional investors. And secondly, potential to create more liquidity in the marketplace for their short-term debt. So of the many issues that concentrate the minds of treasurers, there's two that specifically will interest them. You know, where can they obtain funds from and where can they obtain those funds at a cheaper rate? So digitizing the right trade instruments can create an opportunity to achieve both of those points and should hopefully bring more players together in digital marketplaces and in turn create cheaper funding. So I think the future is looking pretty bright when you get that kind of legal underpinning for the overall global digital trade world. Yeah, the rule of law provides both confidence and then as it extends uh, more consistency, which is, I think, helpful for most environments. Thank you for those comments, Ben. So also on technology, another article, HSBC names leader for embedded finance fintech. And so HSBC named Vinay Mendonca as CEO of their joint venture with the B2B trade platform TradeShift. And so the topic that we'll be discussing is what's the outlook on embedded finance? Are we bullish or very bullish? And is there a view that banks will keep this type of activity in-house or follow the joint venture route like HSBC? What do others seem to be pursuing? I guess, Ben, I'll start this out. Feel free to comment if you want. I mean, the growth of the use of APIs to support transactions in an embedded format. So allowing companies to perform trade activities in whatever system they're working on, as opposed to this patchwork quilt of jumping everywhere. This seems to be an inexorable force driving the winners. Those that are disconnected are not going to win. So I think it's a foregone conclusion that I would say I'm very bullish on embedded finance. I guess the view I would have too is that there tends to be two choices. If you're a really large bank, let's say a trillion dollar bank, you have two options. You can do it internally or you can use a hybrid approach. If you're a mid-size or smaller size commercial organization, you're really going to want to go the partner route to support the tech. Those seem to be the two plays here. And I guess the headline for me is banks are solving this problem, either internal or hybrid. Uh, or partnering, or they're not acting. And that's a that's a worrying thing if they're not acting and moving forward in the embedded world, which will certainly be adopted more heavily. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely a lot of the banks that I speak to, it's something that's one of their key focuses at the moment and has been for like the last couple of years. I think finding out the best ways to achieve this, and they see it as like a, a new market that's exciting and open for them, and also something that they can work with their clients with to actually try and almost cement that relationship even further. So it's definitely something I think we'll see a lot more about it in the new year as well. 
So Ben, turning to our third theme, which is anti-greenwashing. We spoke about uh, greenwashing. We talked about ESG kind of taking a little bit of a less acceleration than before. The greenwashing issue is a big cause of some of the pullback. Fraud rates are expected to continue. This seems to be impacting the perspective and view. So how will this work? How will the anti-greenwashing legislation and rules, how will that work and how long will it take before it becomes effective and reduces this impediment towards, uh, you know, let's say more green energy, for example? Yeah, it's very appropriate that we're talking about this, obviously, with COP28 uh, happening as we're recording. Um, The main kind of thrust behind this story was, again, something that came out of the UK from the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, who've put together a package of measures to try and improve trust and transparency in sustainable investment products, which is, as you say, something we've talked about um, being perhaps one of the negative sides that has uh, maybe caused a loss of momentum in the, in the push towards ESG and sustainable finance. Uh, there's an estimated uh, $18.4 trillion of ESG-orientated assets now being managed globally. Um, so the FCA is implementing these new sustainability declo- disclosure requirements and an investment labels regime um, after engagement with, uh, with industry. Uh, research that they found showed that investors weren't confident um, about the sustainability-related claims made Uh, for investments. Um, And that's not helped by a lack of consistency around the terms, again, which we've talked about, you know, what's green, what's ESG, what's sustainable, what what fundamentally does that mean? So some of the things the FCA has brought in is from uh, December next year, asset managers who market their funds as sustainable will have to choose one of four specific fund labels and demonstrate that they apply to at least 70% of their assets. So trying to get a bit more certainty in there and funds that use these labels or that make any sustainability related claims in their marketing uh, must publish a two page summary for retail clients of their evidence based stewardship strategy and theory of change, uh, kind of based on independently assessed uh, standards, um, things like the greenhouse gas target or alignment with the EU taxonomy on this. Um, so, that approach could perhaps also. Uh, in future be extended to portfolio managers, overseas funds, pension products, financial advisors. So clearly quite a significant change. And uh, also from next May, something else, um, all FCA authorised companies will be subject to anti-greenwashing rules, building on a requirement that the marketing of financial products and services should be clear, correct, complete and fair. So there's a lot um, going on. And I think there's currently um, $242 billion of funds in the UK that are marketed as sustainable, uh, which is slightly less than the US. I think it's around $290 billion in the US and $2 trillion uh, in, in mainland Europe. And until now, there's not really been um, much to stop uh, <laughs> those in the asset manage- in, uh, management industry having a bit of a free hand to sort of badge and label products as they like. So uh, I think in general, you know, it's something, as you say, we mentioned recently, the term ESG might perhaps be past its sell-by date in terms of the competing topics under one banner um, and just kind of tackling that marketing phrase and really trying to get back to something a bit more meaningful is I think what the FCA is trying to do here. So uh, watch this space. Uh, I'm not sure um, some of the news we've had out of COP28 is a, is quite fraught and uh, uh, some, some interesting things that I might bring up in, in a second on the pod as well. So it's definitely, um, there is a bit of pushback and there's some conflict in here. But I think actually, again, being able to try and uh, legislate around this and just really tightening up those definitions so that people can be held accountable to what they, uh, what they purport to be um, promoting. I think that's the most important thing here. Yeah, words have meanings, labels have meanings. It's like organic, you know, this food is organic. What does that mean? So uh, let's bring the uh, the podcast discussion to its uh, peak, which is what's your choice for the most important story or theme of this past week or month? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned COP28 and I'm going to stay over there. There was a story that I read um, this morning um, that the president of COP28, Sultan Al-Jabbar, has claimed there's no science indicating that a phase-out of fossil fuels is needed to restrict global heating. Uh, And he also said uh, that a phase-out of fossil fuels wouldn't allow sustainable development unless you want to take the world, in quotes, back into caves. 
Um, so quite strong words from the oil tycoon there. <laughs> Clearly it doesn't uh, align with his interests to be doing much about uh, uh, fossil fuels and carbon. He's quite happy with the status quo. Um, so I just think that shows what people that are trying to um, get a handle on this global problem that affects all of us are up against. You know, there's a lot of people that are very rich that don't want anything changing with how things are done. And to have that at kind of the, the peak of uh, a sustainable uh, climate change uh, confronting conference, something that's supposed to be fixing this issue for the whole world, uh, if if there's uh, you know a lot of contrarian voices there, I'm not sure there's too much hope for the rest of us. Well, perhaps uh, the debate will help pull some things out, right? Get the issues on the table. Yeah, really uh, interesting. I, I haven't been keeping up on that uh, dialogue as much. Ben, for me, the global economy seems to be doing reasonably well overall, reasonably well, like moderate. If we look at um, weakened Asia group, you know, China and Japan, some you know concerns there offset by a little bit stronger U.S. than the opposite side of the, let's say, the the mark. And then Europe is probably slightly above level. And so I would say over time, if we go back six months or a year uh, in the past, there's less concern about where things are than before. So it's kind of like the globe is probably about where the U.K. is, right? Slightly above, not roaring growth, but slightly above normal. And so it seems like it's eased a bit. So hopefully we'll do better coming in on that. Fingers crossed. Yeah, let's be optimistic heading in towards the new year. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Ben. Thanks, Craig. As always, look in the show notes for links to these articles and visit ctmfile.com. This podcast is provided for information purposes only and statements made by CTM file or guests on this podcast are not intended as legal, business or consulting advice. For more information, visit ctmfile.com.